Welcome to another exciting presentation of the Project for Progress, a program dedicated to giving you an in-depth look into areas in our current events and providing a fresh and intriguing perspective regarding many of today's most perplexing issues. So join Mark, Gary and the rest of the crew as we examine areas in our history, ancient history, world religion and philosophy, and unexplained phenomenon. Yes, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another session. Wait for that video to fade out. Yes, <laughs> to our opening season. This is another program in the Project for Progress. I'm Gary Dean, and with me is my first office officer, none other than Mr. Mark Pruitt. Mark, how are you? I'm great this, this afternoon. I mean, to say it's been a fast day. And it's it's been a, a definitely a beautiful week. The yeah, it, it has. Yeah, for, for what we went through down here in the south with the weather late in late January with the ice and the snow. And, oh, my God, the freezing temperatures. Don't yeah. remind me of that. But nonetheless, we have a very exciting program for you today. Um, and it's going to be another magnificent master class. And this is our a premier program with our another uh, extinguished member of our team, Ms. Laura Hartley. And she, what she will have to say, you know, we're in the you already see uh, underneath my name, cultural wayfinding. People are probably already asking, what the hell is cultural wayfinding? What are you talking about? You'll find out. And you're going to want to listen to every word, every syllable, and everything that we're going to talk about because you will learn how, which also means when you You're talking about finding your way through the culture and finding a direct route to getting to where you should be within the culture and helping to shape the culture. All of that will be laid out. Now, this is going to be part one. There are other parts that we're going to do within the series, but without any further ado, we are going to play our intro video introduction to none other than our distinguished guests. Let's watch. Laura Hartley is an activist, writer, and coach known for founding Public Love Enterprises, a school dedicated to helping change makers unlearn and dismantle inhibiting systems while envisioning and seeding a more just, regenerative, and loving world. Raised in Sydney, Australia, Laura is currently based in Canada and has lived in London, Dublin, and Amsterdam. She is a climate and environmental activist, advocating for nonviolent direct action and training others in Kenyan nonviolence conflict reconciliation. Laura's upbringing around coaching has been influential, as her mother owned a school that trained coaches. Laura is described as type A organized, a recovering perfectionist, and someone who can become highly stressed. She has become a mindfulness and meditation teacher to address her stress response. She is spiritual but not religious, believing that spirituality is about how we show up for ourselves and the world. A voracious reader, Laura's influences include authors such as Kazuhaga, Adrian Mari Brown, Colin Beaven, Stephen Jenkinson, Joanna Macy, and Rob Hopkins. She also enjoys the On Being with Krista Tippett podcast. Laura and her team at Public Love Enterprises believe in actively participating in change, emphasizing the need to build as they resist, heal as they end harm, and liberate as they fight. Their work is committed to unlearning and dismantling structures and systems that inhibit collective thriving while striving for a more just, regenerative, and loving world. Laura, let me bring you on. How are you? Good to see you again. Good, thank you. I, what an introduction. Like, thank you so much. It's always good to be here. Yeah. Well, to be here is something that you need to get used to now that you're a member of the team. In fact, in our introduction our program, we referred to you as, I think, a second lieutenant, Laura Hartley. So you are one of our distinguished officers 
because your work is is second to none and it definitely is needed which we're going to begin and launch today in this program and one of the things that you and i have discussed based on your recent work that you've been doing with cultural wayfinding um and with that being said i'm going to let you start it off and kind of explain to us what cultural wayfinding is yeah so cultural wayfinding is a term Well, it's one of my courses, but it's a term that I really use in order to explain the inner leadership journey that we need to take to move from the world as it is to the world as it could be. So how do we start to understand the systems that shape our world, the way we've internalized these systems, the stories that belong to them? How do we steward our power? And how do we find what is ours to do in this time? So following that sense of calling and vocation that I think each and every one of us has. Okay. Let me turn up my mic again. That in and of itself kind of it gives you let me let me kind of back out here. Okay, I screwed up. There we go. All right. Um, That's why I need a producer somebody to do this for me. (laughs) But yes, and now we're going to we're going to dig into kind of give an introductory to cultural weight finding. Um, If people have been to your website, which is lowerhartley.com, they will see the work that you do with public love, they will see everybody's not always going to agree with it. But with that being the case, this is why we're here doing what we're doing to explain, to go into detail, to give the explanation and make the, one of my favorite words, make the case for this position. Because me personally, I think this the case needs to be made. And uh, when we bring up this particular, I'm going to bring up this slide presentation that will talk about, it kind of breaks down, and I'll let you, of course, elaborate on it as well. All right. Cultural Wayfinding Module 1, because this is part one of this series. This will be more the first of many, a few programs that we're going to do on this subject. There's Laura. Now, Laura, explain this chart to us and what it means and how we could kind of make it plain for people to get a handle on it for themselves. Yeah, so the chart that we're looking at is really the framework or a part of the framework of one of my programs and unpacking some of the stories that shape our world. So maybe, you know, just as a kind of precursor, it's it's worth understanding that when I'm talking about stories, I'm really talking about beliefs. I'm talking about a mindset, about values, about the thoughts that so many of us have that uphold the world that it is and that shape the world that it has. And every system, right, cultural, political, economic, has a mindset. Every system has a story. And I think as we start to understand that story, because a lot of the time they live unconscious in our society, they run through us, they live through us, but we kind of don't question them, we don't see them then we have the potential to actually change the system, right? It is through seeing the story that we have agency, that we have the opportunity to choose whether we want to participate in it or not. So what this particular framework is looking at is three of the big systems that exist in our world and their manifestations, their internalized version of them. So the first of these stories is capitalism. Now, capitalism is an economic system, Uh, certainly it's the dominant system of the global north, but it's also an ideology, you know, and the story of capitalism is really built on three foundational principles. So the first of these is the pursuit of infinite growth on a finite planet. It is why as a climate activist, we say it's one of the leading drivers of the climate crisis because capitalism is obsessed with growth. It is its only understanding of growth, of success is growth. I think it was Edward Abbey, though, who said growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the cancer cell. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this idea that growth always means success isn't actually true. It's just the narrow framework that we have attached to it. Capitalism story is also built on the manufactured production of scarcity. Okay, so you can't have infinite growth without scarcity to drive that growth. Okay, so, you know, if you're feeling satiety or satisfaction or abundance, they're very poor drivers of growth. So scarcity is built into capitalism. Now this shows up through planned obsolescence. Okay, so we design so many of our products, our phones, our blenders, our toothbrushes, you know, if they're electric, 
to break before they have to, you know, or to make them extremely difficult or expensive to repair. So we do that by design in order to drive consumption. We also do it in marketing. We have like the FOMO and the urgency marketing that says you've got to buy now or miss out. Um, you know, so there's all of this scarcity that is baked in through austerity policies, through luxury goods, into every aspect of capitalism to drive growth. And you have the third principle, which is the devaluation of beautiful, living, complex systems like jungles and oceans and forests to life mm -hmm. sources. Right. Okay. This is the story of capitalism. And we could take it a bit deeper, but that's really where it lives. We also have another big system that makes up our world, which is the system of patriarchy. Now, patriarchy is a system that really just values men and the masculine over all others. And it's particularly good at leveraging shame for power. Like this is kind of its MO and it does this in a number of ways. You know, uh, some of the really obvious ones are obviously the shame that sometimes comes with physical or sexual violence. You can also see it in the messaging that is given differently to men and women traditionally that's around whether it's the body, whether it's around fitness, whether that's around finances, there's very different stories attached. And very often there is this very subtle element of shame that especially for women, the story is you are not enough as you are. Okay. And maybe if you're just a little bit different, okay just uh, perhaps a little bit thinner, a little bit more controlled, a little bit, um, you know, if we accept you in a different way, then you'll be enough, but you're not quite enough as you are. And we also have the story on this map here of, of separation. Now, separation is really the hyper-individualism that lives in our world. It is the story of us versus them. It is humans and the natural world. Um, and it's the story that says, you know, that it's not me, it's, it's them, it's over there. Okay, or it says that mm, yeah. humans are not part of nature. I was in Montreal last year and I saw this uh, big sign in like the lobby of the biodome. And it says humans in the natural world are on a collision course. And this is an example of that story of separation, right? Humans in the natural world are not on a collision course. Climate change is not one moment of collision. That's not how it works. As soon as we see it like that, then we're not engaging with that problem in the way that we potentially should. But humans in the natural world can't collide because we are the natural world. We are nature. But that story is deeply lacking in our culture. Now, these are not the only three big systems that make up our world. We also, you know, there's white supremacy, there's colonialism, but these are the three that this framework is looking at. And if we're looking at this idea, right, every system has a story. Every system has a mindset. What happens when we live this mindset unquestioned? What happens when we live this story? Yeah. Okay. So the natural response to living the story of, of capitalism, right? It says you've never done enough. You always need to be doing more, having more, being more. That says you should devalue the beautiful living complex system that is your body. Okay. And whatever needs it has. The very natural response to that is burnout. When we look at the story of patriarchy and the story of shame, and shame being leveraged for power, what happens, and I will say, patriarchy is a multi-dimensional story, so I'm very much speaking from the perspective of a woman here, but what happens when you start to internalize that story that says you're never quite enough as you are, or that you need to be different? Well, a natural response to that is perfectionism. It's self-shaming. It's saying, oh, I could be better, or it's not quite good enough. It's that self-doubt that's there. And what happens when we believe that story of separation that says, mm -hmm. I'm one person, that problem's too big, it's all the way over there, who am I to do anything, my vote doesn't matter. We feel powerless. There you go, right there. Right? And so these systems have this kind of negative feedback loop that in turn, these responses uphold the system because you can't challenge any of them when you're burnt out or exhausted or feeling powerless. And they also keep it in place, right? It's just the... In turn, we live it into existence, and it's that cycle that just goes on and on. So this is the framework that we're really looking at in cultural wayfinding. You know, how do we start to recognize these stories, understand them, and do the work of getting free of them? All right. I'm, already, I'm getting excited already. Mark, do you have any questions so far? Because before I queue up, uh, Clyde's going to bring us another presentation in terms of unraveling the toxic narratives. But do you have any questions, my friend?
Well, just looking at this chart, this is the exact chart that I am prepared to bring up when I went to your website. Um, you know, the one thing about the chart that I like, um, uh, and, um, it, it makes a lot of sense when you look at the, uh, the, the part about the, uh, let's see, what was it that caught my attention? It was the, um, when you feel powerless, uh, now, as it pertains to feeling powerless, would this so so would this more so be an adolescent Laura and and female type um you know um would it be a, a structure some type of um mishap um I'm trying to get my head together. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, when you Is it feel the sense powerless, of feeling powerless? Yeah. Yes, but as does it more so pertain to adolescents, meaning male and or female, and women? I would say no. I mean, in some sense, mm -hmm. yes, depending on, I, I think there is a dynamic there actually that raises a good point, mm -hmm. particularly because I think that women and anybody gender non-conforming is often taught that their voice doesn't matter mm -hmm. or they have less representation. Mm -hmm. And so there is that sense of, well, maybe I can't, um, it, it, there's a sense of self-doubt that creeps in more. But I think the story of feeling powerless or the experience of feeling powerless mm -hmm. isn't necessarily unique in that experience. So much of the world has the story of why bother making change? What impact can I make? I'm one person. You know, mm -hmm. will, will my vote even bother doing anything? Or, you know, this, you know, I'd love to do something, but ugh, it's just too hard. Like nobody listens to me. I don't think that story is unique to women. I think there's plenty of men who experience that story as well. And there's certainly plenty of people with far more power than they think that they have who believe that story of powerlessness. There is a lot invested in us believing that we are powerless because when we believe we are powerless, yes. power structures stay exactly as they are. The world stays exactly as it is because we do not challenge it. So yes. I think there's dynamics, but I don't think it's particularly unique. I think it's more universal. As in, yes, as in politics. And, yes. Uh, Certainly in terms of making change in the world. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So, and, and, and up on the patriarchy, Archie, patriarchy, the value of male leadership, uh, which is something that, that here in this country, we have a big problem with, as you probably know, uh, especially within a particular culture. And it, it seems, and that particular culture seems to suffer in our culture more than anything, the value of male leadership. And again, it has rendered the male leadership in the black community mainly more than anything because it has disembodied us individually away from our culture. So I think that, um, that when you have these, uh, and I noticed you have some up, uh, upcoming modules um, in these modules, I'm sorry, I'm just not together today. I'm sorry. It's just, but, but in these uh, modules, I noticed that you have, uh, some, some dates where, um, like in, for Europe and North America, uh, the first session is Tuesday, February the 27th. Um, as to where you're going to give, um, would this be like a, it's a session and, um, and is it more so of a coaching session about the? Uh... Yeah, so I've, it's an inner leadership course. So people mm -hmm. enroll in the course, and yeah. then it, those are the dates where it's running over 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. And it is run live over Zoom. So people come, we kind of have a bit of a presentation, we unpack a story. People have the opportunity to go into breakout groups, to meet with others, to, okay. um, to unpack it for themselves. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's very informative because uh, I wish I had a dove into this a little earlier. I, I probably had ample time. I at least had a couple of weeks to prepare for this, but you know, even in retirement, you stay busy because there's, <laughs> there's a lot of other things that you have to do. You're just not sitting at all home all the time. So, you know, and, and unlike yourself, Laura, when you said you had to bring yourself from one 
uh dimension to the other you know we travel <laughs> we travel in these in these uh portals and you know in these dimensions uh it just depends on what the task is at hand you know and sometimes it takes me a little bit longer to segue away from those tasks you know no, okay. this is, yeah. speed is essential to our business and i know you uh that will um will remedy itself now <clears throat> another solid and he took one of your writings laura in talking about unraveling toxic narrative stories which we'll get deeper into as we further venture into this but let me play this particular clip from our our narrator mr clyde the world is made through stories stories are what we believe the way we make sense of the world they're a form of meaning making that underpins every system and culture big or small Stories also play out consciously and unconsciously, shaping our thoughts and actions. But the stories that underpin our culture are toxic. The story of capitalism and its endless quest for more. The story of scarcity and its lie that there's not enough to go around. The story of supremacy says one race, gender, or body is superior to another. The story of separation says humans are separate from nature. That our well-being is not tied to that of our non-human kin. These stories are killing us. So cultural wayfinding starts with learning and unlearning these stories. Part of acting in the world, of finding what is yours to do in this time, that unique calling only you have, is the ability to see a story, sense its signature, and choose something more. We disentangle ourselves from their perceived reality so that we can seed new stories in the world. Stories of compassion. Stories of connection, stories of satiety and abundance, stories of regeneration, stories of love. There you go. Now, that is a basic writing that you've done in connection to this. As we proceed in the slide presentation, we go to cultural wayfinding is about navigating the world as it is. Let me play the sound associated with that. Cultural wayfinding is about navigating from the world as it is to the world as it could be. Rooted in the realities of the crises we're facing, social, ecological and humanitarian, it is following the urgent calling of our time to be part of reimagining our lives and world. Cultural wayfinding centres around three ideas. One, getting free, stepping out of shame and scarcity dismantling capitalism and patriarchy from the inside out. Two, stewarding our power, to not just claim power, but read a room for it, to steward it and share it with others, to wield it with love. Three, finding out what's ours to do currently, because we all have a calling, a role to play in remaking the world. Laura, I'll allow you to comment on that on the other side now here. Oh, gosh. I mean, you know, the, hearing that is is wonderful transitioning from that American accent to that lovely British accent there. That, um, that was on purpose. <laughs> anyway, it's really speaking to a lot of what we're talking about, right? The world is made by stories, but most of the time we don't know these stories. We're not taught these stories. They exist unconsciously, but they shape mm -hmm. our thoughts, they shape our actions, mm -hmm. they shape our words. And so when we can actually learn the story, we have agency, we have power. And this benefits us personally and our own lives, because it means that we can let go of expectations and patterns and values that maybe don't actually serve us, that don't make us happy, that don't contribute to our well-being. But it also means that collectively, we can start to see a deeper type of change. Because we live in such a pivotal time right now, okay? We have the climate crisis. We are confronting multiple humanitarian crises. We're facing, uh, you know, economic crises all over the world because we're part of systems that are crumbling, that cannot withstand the, 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 the challenges that they've set for themselves. And so really this time is about the unmaking and when we can learn the story, we can actually rewrite it. And I don't think this is work we do alone. I don't think this is work we do just as individuals. I think this is collective work that we do in all of our communities in starting to ask the good questions or the, the big questions around, you know, what matters to us? What gives us meaning? How do we want to live? Because then we can start to write something new. All right. Let 
me turn up turn up my microphone here again <laughs> what i love about what you do laura is that you get directly to the point without any fat without any any hesitation and now let's move on to the next slide the whole notion of western economics the whole notion of scarcity comes from a man that i am very well familiar with as a result don't laugh don't laugh as a result of a tv show that talked about thomas malthus which you're seeing on your screen right now thomas malthus is the guy and as i i'm gonna repeat what i said in our pre-show fist fight if you want to call it that he fucked up everything because thomas malthus philosophy went something like this let's listen malthusian theory of population malthus argued that population growth tends to outstrip the food supply leading to widespread poverty and suffering he proposed that population increases geometrically while food supply increases arithmetically malthus believed that without preventive checks such as moral restraint delayed marriage and celibacy and positive checks like disease famine and war overpopulation would lead to misery and vice malthus's ideas significantly impacted 19th century social and economic theory his theory of population growth influenced economists and policymakers including david ricardo and john stuart mill malthus's work contributed to developing classical economics and understanding the relationship between population and resources malthus's theories have been criticized for being overly pessimistic and underestimating the potential for technological advancements to increase food production despite criticisms malthusian ideas remain relevant in global population growth resource scarcity and environmental sustainability discussions in conclusion thomas malthus's work laid the foundation for studying population growth and its societal implications while his theories have been criticized they remain influential in economics sociology and environmental studies laura your thoughts on mr malthus Oh, so, you know, look, the big thing that's standing out that I really want to address here is that overpopulation is not the problem. Mm -hmm. It is not that there's too many people in this world. And the challenge with that line of thinking is it very much leads to like eco-fascism very quickly. And the idea that some people should have children and some people shouldn't. And this is completely unjust. It is, it, it's grounded in uh, very, go. very toxic there ideas. You there you go. Okay. So, so I really want to address that straight up. There is not too many people in this world. That is not the problem. We do have an unfair and inequitable distribution of resources. That is a problem. We have a very large population in this world that maybe can't live sustainably in the way that in Western nations in the global North, uh, everybody can't live with quite the way that we are living. And that really just means we need this reassessment of, well, actually, what does it mean to be in community? What does it mean to live a good life? What does it mean um, to live you know, in relationship to the world around us? This does mean changing our diets. This does mean eating radically less meat. This does mean changing the way that we farm, the way that we uh, produce for consumption. Mm -hmm. This does mean changing our economic system so that it's not based on infinite growth. But the problem itself is not people, and that is a very, very toxic idea that I really want to discredit right now, that, that that's not anything that I support or anything that is in alignment with the world as it could be. Yes, and thank you. Thank you for that, yeah. you know, that discreditation. Because uh, when I hear those type of um, um, ideas and, and, and toxic thoughts and... It's ideology, first of all. This is exactly what it is. And when and what comes to my mind when they talk about depopulating the world, because that's basically what he was saying, low key. Was the you know, a way to depopulate the world. This is why that's right. The world right. should be depopulated. And here lately, so much um there's been other people talking the same way, mostly the billionaires, the people with the largest platforms i just wonder laura are they talking about themselves are they including themselves in this never they're never talking about themselves it's, it's, right it's, they're always talking about somewhere else exactly that's <laughs> why i say and i said this the other day in our last podcast 
with um with Gary and uh our good friend um um Wajid. Wajid, Wajid Hassan, Hassan Wajid. Um Wajid. that's why I don't listen to billionaires. I, I rarely do. Because when all of a sudden, when people have money or a large platform, that's where they can get the masses to listen to them. All of a sudden, they know everything. All of a sudden, now they're God, you know. And I don't listen to that many millionaires. You know who I listen to? I listen to the people that have failed the most, but they're still out there trying, and they're making a difference, and they're serving their communities, yeah. and they're serving people. Those are the people I listen to. They're still connected. I, I listen to people who value humility. Yeah. yeah. Not in not in humility. <laughs> well, look look at look at Elon Musk. Uh, I'll just go ahead and say it. Train the, Rick. The scent, this the guy is totally train nuts. Rick. I'm not gonna listen to anything he has to say because I think he has a distortion or the store or or let's put it right. right. Let me say it right. Mind. A distorted perspective of reality. He doesn't understand, nor can he relate to the working man. He can't relate to what society... <laughs> and don't get me started, because this man has my driver's license. Well, <laughs> when you're living, Laura, and I'll ask you this question. When you're living on a different plane from what the average human being is, how do you Keep yourself grounded in your thoughts. Great how, question. Mark. How does a Great human question, being Mark. keep it level as to where you don't start to get too far away from your body, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is reality? What do we do to stay grounded? Because it Good is question, easy Mark. to slip away. It is. Take I, it away you know what? You could yeah. give. You could give me ten million dollars, and I'd have to either wheel myself back in six months down the road. Or my wife or some family member, you know, maybe. And so there's a there's a disease, there's a there's a disconnect. Why does this cause such disconnect? Because we're living on a different planes. Do we Look, forget? I, I think there's a few factors here, right? Like certainly yeah. if you're looking at the context of billionaires, I think we also you have to consider the, the myth of the meritocracy that we live in, the idea that everybody is where they are simply because of merit, because they're yeah. talented enough or work hard yeah. enough. And it's completely yeah. inaccurate. That's not the world that we live in. The world that we live in is also shaped by systems yeah. that are influenced by race, by gender, by economic status, yeah. Yeah. by abilities, you know, by class. There is so much that goes into it. But we don't always see that. We think if somebody has a large amount of money, we conflate that with respect, we conflate it with power, we conflate it with knowledge, we conflate it with, oh, they must be somehow deserving. You know, even within forms of Christianity, there's this idea of like the prosperity gospel, I think it is. Um, I may yeah. have that term wrong. You know, no, somehow, you're right. No, you're right? right? You've you're gotten right. to where you're you right. are because, you know, you're, you're really, you're special and you're favorite and like you've done something good. And it, that's, that's a wonderful story for whoever's like on the receiving end. But yes. it's not actually grounded in reality. Right. So I think there's that aspect. But I think to answer your other question of how do we actually stay grounded, uh -huh. I think that comes from a couple of different spaces. I think that one comes from speaking to, you know, people in all walks of life. It means having a wide variety of relationships, listening to diverse voices, you know, listening to people that, you know, sometimes are speaking from the margins and not everyone just from the center. I think it maintains, as you said, actually having a connection to your own body and noticing, like, what am I feeling? Where am I feeling it? Where is this coming from? I think self-inquiry and contemplation and meditation are beautiful, transformative tools that humans have practiced for thousands of years because they give us self-insight. So I think that there's so many different ways that we can practice it. But that cultural story that says somehow if you were in this position of power or this position of influence, that you must have something valid to say is one that we also need to unpack together. Yes. Yes. I, I agree. You know, it's almost like when, uh, you know, I don't know how many times this ever happened to you, but certainly for Gary and I, you know, when you see certain individuals and you, and you uh, come across them and every time you acknowledge them as in just passing by and speaking, they always acknowledge back blessed and highly favored. 
you know, that's the term. And maybe that just may be another cultural thing. That's the term that uh, we get here, you know, all the time. And uh, so I started answering back. Well, well, I'm blessed and highly favored too. You know, uh, it's right. yeah. it's misdirection and it's misled and it's miseducation. It gets thrown out there a lot, Mark. It, 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 it does. does. And, 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 and I don't like it. Uh, because Neither do I. Neither because do I. we don't really know the meaning behind it, and and most people that say it to you, they don't know the meaning behind it or where it, it derived from, you know. But um, it's it's still um, a a destruction. It is it is a cultural, societal, and also a community. <laughs> div, you know, it's very divisive and it's infectious. It is. It's, it's designed infectious, that way. and it has hit this nation, this country, like a wave. It it it, it, it is crazy, and it and it doesn't stop. It just doesn't stop, Laura. So, so what do we do to dial back? What do we? How do we? You know, because it's it. See, people don't listen to us, as we said a few days ago when Gary and I was having a conversation. They don't listen to us because we talk about the truth. And the truth just doesn't sound good. Mm -hmm. See, what sounds good is propaganda, lies. I'll just go ahead and say it. And that's mostly what gets the views, the viewership, and they get the most bandwidth. So what do we do to Mm -hmm. rearrange, to help? rearrange and restructure the mindset so we can get our families back. We can get our families back in the household. That's her back wheelhouse. Together. That is exactly her wheelhouse. Go ahead. Take it away. Well, Lord. I want to say, I actually think that these are, there's kind of two different questions here, right? It is, there is, it is the question of how do we kind of tackle misinformation? How do yes. we, you know, enhance collectively our critical thinking skills, uh, our, you know, digital literacy, all of these things that we actually need to be able to engage with the media today, which yes. we're not taught in school. I don't, I certainly wasn't. No. I don't know about you guys. Like no. we're not taught um, these ideas of how do we actually engage with political systems that are, you know, based on lies or mm-hmm. when we, you know, have an entire media network sometimes that is profitable because of clicks and the challenge that very good media companies actually will face in that environment as well. Yes. So that's that's a different question of how do we actually start to deal with the complexities of the world and making change. Mm-hmm. And then there's the question of how do we start to do the work ourselves of getting free and of challenging those systems from the inside out. And I think there's a couple of different ways we can do this. The first is really through this like critical thinking lens, you know, so when we're talking about, let's say burnout, you know, and we're feeling exhausted and we're realizing that we've started to make those connections between capitalism and the energy of capitalism and my own actions. So maybe I have that feeling that I've never done enough. Maybe I have that feeling of time scarcity, that there's just not enough time or that I see resilience as endurance, like pushing through, how much can I withstand, right? We didn't never give ourselves any time to rest, never listen to our body, and we're reaching that stage of burnout. Mm-hmm. Well, one aspect of critical thinking there is actually asking these questions of, well, who benefits when I feel this way, Right. okay? Right, who benefits when I act from this energy? And like, go wide there, think about what power structures are upheld, what companies are upheld, what systems are upheld, mm-hmm. who benefits? Because there are always people who benefit. Think about what goes unmade, what goes uncreated, mm-hmm. right? Who misses out when they act from this energy? Yes. yes. You can also start to get in touch with your body because I really believe our, like we live so neck up, but our body is such a source of wisdom. It is such a place that we, we need to inhabit, right? And that we can listen to and learn from. And so like listening to our body, we can ask ourselves, you know, what would feel liberatory right now? What would feel generative? What would feel good and expansive? You know, what do I need? Because this is always going to be what tells us. And this is a lifelong practice, I think, of really getting in relationship with. So the work is kind of takes a few different aspects of the critical thinking lens of connecting to our own body. And then also starting to actually lean into, well, what feels good? What feels right? What feels open? 
So if it is not a one-time thing, it's not a I'm free and I'm done, it's not an aha moment, those things are great, but it's really that day by day, slightly unsexy work of noticing the story, noticing the pattern, checking in with our body and choosing a different path. I'm going to immediately segue into the next slide, which is our world is made through stories. And this one talks about powerful stories shaped that have, or that has shaped our world. Let's listen and, and watch. The world is made through stories. Stories are what we believe, the way we make sense of the world. They're a form of meaning making that underpins every system and culture, big or small. Stories also play out consciously and unconsciously, shaping our thoughts and actions. But the stories that underpin our culture are toxic. The story of capitalism and its endless quest for more. The story of scarcity and its lie that there's not enough to go around. The story of supremacy says one race, gender or body is superior to another. There you go. There you go, Laura. I'll let yeah. you take it away from there. But these are the stories that make our world, right? Stories live unquestioned. And again, it, it's, we didn't, every people alive today didn't create these stories. These stories have mm -hmm. existed for like centuries. That's but right. when we don't do the work of learning the story and then of actively questioning it and unlearning it ourselves, then we uphold these toxic systems. That's because right. I think that that is our responsibility to do this inner work. You know, it's very easy especially when we're looking in the context of the world to just focus on the external change that is necessary. But we also need this inner shift in this time, okay? We can't dismantle all of these systems and expect to create something that is just and that is regenerative without actually understanding the system and the mindset that created it in the first place. And then without understanding, hey, how do I maybe uphold that unconsciously? So it isn't... You know, when I talk about unlearning scarcity, for example, <clears throat> this isn't about pretending that scarcity doesn't exist. It's not about saying, you know, everybody has enough and, you know, just to live in this fantasy land. Right. It's more about recognizing, <clears throat> oh, well, how do I feel like maybe I'm not enough, mm -hmm. right? My, I'm, self, I'm scarce in my self-worth. Where do I feel that I don't have enough time or I'm not supported enough? You know, where do I just feel like, oh, well, of course I've got to get what's mine. Of course you've got to compete mm -hmm. because it's not enough to right. go around. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. And then how can I start to actually get creative with the resources that I have, uh, with the resources that exist in the world, with my own internal sense of enoughness, with my own sense of abundance, and then do this inner work of like starting to play in different dimensions. Because I think it's from that space of really starting to seed the world that we want into our body, into our thoughts, into our words, into our actions, that we can make real change. Mark, do you have any questions? Oh, uh, actually, I don't know if it's if it's really a question, but um, I will I will say that to get some clarity for our listeners. And the best way to find out is, is to go back uh, to Laura's website, um, Cultural Wayfinding. Gary, if you bring the slide over. That's laurahartley.com. Laura Laura Hartley okay. Yeah, that's where they'll find it. Yes. And, 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 and so um, it covers, it just seems like it covers so many bases of, um, of, of the uh, societies the societal issues that we face today and the family issues because it's all connected. It's all connected together. Um, the, uh, some of the, um, some of the, this stuff is destructive and it is torn down. Uh, it not just, yeah, it, it's it, is, it is moving. It is moving as we speak and it's finding its way like a fine poison, you know, through, uh, through, uh, um, you know, through the veins. Of, media media the is the first. The, the, the media. It is, is media. The first vehicle of which this is being delivered. It is, but then it's finding, then it's, comes politics. It's finding its way through the vein of the foundation of our family 
which is yeah. and the foundation of our family is a very fabric fabric excuse me of humanity well let's let's go to the last um sound in conjunction with this i want to say right. something there as well just to kind of answer that that you know ahead, media Mark. has ahead, a role Mark. in in telling stories it does and sometimes you know especially when we're looking at the amount of crises that we're facing right now media traditional media doesn't always do a good enough job in conveying the history of those stories and the opportunities and the solutions available to us so like there absolutely is a role here for media to do better but when I'm talking about stories, I also think sometimes when we talk about media, we can, it's easy for it to sound like blaming the media, like, oh, well, you know, it's just their fault and they tell these wrong stories and everything else. And mm -hmm. there are certain networks right. that are like that, that should be banned. And mm -hmm. I'm going to say that straight up. Um, but a lot of the time as well, we have to recognize that these things are intrinsic to being human. So that mm -hmm. like journalists are also born into this world. They're also born into these unconscious stories. Mm -hmm. And right. so... It's less of, in my mind, although there are power structures who benefit from them and who benefit from holding them in place, it's less of a deliberate thing and more of also a, a kind of feedback loop that just feeds itself and it becomes self-perpetuating. So I just kind of want to make that distinction there with media that they have a role in telling these, they can do way better. Some networks are absolutely terrible, but it's also a human thing as well right. one more question one more question gary i'm sorry go ahead so so who is to hold the media responsible well i think we are and like i think we, we can hold the media more accountable and i think the media should be more accountable i also think that you know there are aspects of the media that's doing quite well and there are some places that are trialing new things so it's not to say that they're not accountable mm -hmm. but more when we're talking about these particular systems, right? When we're talking about patriarchy, we're talking about capitalism. These are also like mm -hmm. big human right. unlearnings, right? Mm -hmm. the, these are things that we're all unlearning, but yeah. they are, they do need to be held accountable. So I'm, that should follow, I'm, I'm sorry, again, that should follow ahead, upon some, sen some type of censorship, um, the content in which we discuss and what I we think talk there about is a, and what we don't talk about. Yeah, there, look, there needs to be rules around hate speech. There needs to be, uh, you know, there need to be boundaries around what kind of voices you actually give validity to. You know, when you invite a climate skeptic on and a climate scientist, that is not, they're not equal voices. They don't deserve equal weighting. That's so that, a problem of the media that has happened. That right, should that, be held accountable. And you know, you shouldn't be able to hop on and lie. That also should not be unaccountable and generally isn't considered possible either. But and that's a good tool directly towards unlearning the stories of separation unlearning what the media propaganda is and that's what this last clip in conjunction to this slide represents the story of separation says humans are separate from nature that our well-being is not tied to that of our non-human kin these stories are killing us so cultural wayfinding starts with learning and unlearning these stories part of acting in the world of finding what is yours to do in this time, that unique calling only you have, is the ability to see a story, sense its signature, and choose something more. We disentangle ourselves from their perceived reality so that we can seed new stories into the world. Stories of compassion, stories of connection, stories of satiety and abundance, stories of regeneration, stories of love. Laura, your thoughts? I think this is really about also starting to just vision the world as it could be. You mm -hmm. know, when I talked at the beginning about so many of us feel powerless in the world, right. you know, many of us don't even know what the world we want would look like. And there's a, there is a quote, I don't know who says this, this isn't me. Um, so if anybody knows, like, feel free to tell me. And it says that, you know, it's easier sometimes to imagine uh, the apocalypse, the literal end of the world, than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And this is because we are trained not to think about the world that we actually want. You right. know, we're trained to say, well, this is just how it is. This is the way life is. Money doesn't grow on trees. You can't have everything you want. Uh, you know, who do you think you are? So we have all of these kind of uh, holds in place that keep us in the, in the places that we're in and that make it difficult to dream. So part of the work of unlearning a story and to get free is also so that we can start to see new ones, 
so that we can start to say, well, hey, what do I actually, what is the story I want my economic system to, to be based on? Is it one of abundance? Is it one of well-being? Is it one that measures what matters? Or is it one that's just obsessed with growth and with prioritizing yeah. private ownership over public yeah. goods and public spaces? You know, what do I want the, the stories of my community to be? Do I want them to be one where we always fear the other, where there's huge amounts of violence and division and we don't trust one another? Or do we want it to be ones that are based on connection, that are based on community? So what do we want the stories of our world to be? You know, of our trade agreements, of um, our migration systems. What do we want that to actually look like? And so this is that question that I think we can start to ask here of, you know, if these are the stories that are making the world and they're no longer serving us, what are the stories that will? And how do we live them into reality? Okay. Before I, we go, go to closing, Mark, what do you have as we move toward the end of this program? Well, I think we've covered as much as we can cover about um, cultural wayfinding and the definition of it and how it just, can be affected. Just the first part of it where we got more to go. <laughs> That's why I said yeah. we've covered as much as we possibly can. There is a lot more to cover, but it it does, it does uh, you know, culminate some of the inadequacies that we have issues you know, as society and on this planet, because of this is widespread. And uh, we have not been the same since uh, in several years since since the pandemic. So yeah. um, uh, there's been a lot of occurrences and, and a lot of things that happened. And just uh, for our listening audience, uh, guys, I just want you all to, to understand we are talking to someone Miss Laura Hartley, she is an activist, she is a coach, she is a life moderator, and she is qualified and well-educated. And as you can see, she's very responsive and quick. She's very quick on her feet. And Laura, I just, I want to thank you once again, because this is the second time I've been on with you. And, and it brought me back to when we were on before last year, and the, it was so candid. The conversation was so candid. Every aspect about it was so candid until it was, we went from one depth to the other, <laughs> you know, so it's never one subject. It's never mm -hmm. one. So it starts out as one right. subject, yeah. but as you say, there's so many other elements that can define mm -hmm. what the issues and the problems that we have today and how it is just torn apart our families and it and it normally starts it it starts with the with the mother then the father and then it just affects the children and next thing you know you don't have a family and that's why we need more people like you thank you i'm really glad that my work resonates and i you know thank you for having me on here and letting me speak as always and thank you again for having me on Oh, as always, um, you are a member of this, of this team and your understanding, your perspective and your work has a significant or plays a significant role in what we want to do here in the project for progress. So I'm just totally elated and I thank you. I can't thank you enough for being with us during this program. Thank you for the next show. And until that time. We'll see you then. You've been listening to yet another masterclass from the Project for Progress. We encourage you to continue to listen and support our efforts and our ongoing work as we strive toward the progress of a better world for everyone. You can find this podcast on iTunes, iHeartRadio, or anywhere you get your podcasts. You can find us on social media such as X, Facebook, and Instagram. Or you can email us at garingerbroadcasting at gmail.com. Be sure to join us for our next exciting episode. And as always, we thank you for listening.